Good evening all, how you doing? Let's see who's lurking. I see Medians here. At Banjo's, Decaf Smurf, Electrical Skateboard, Infinisil. Good to have you all here. And Median, of course. Median, the uh, bug you, uh, the thing you've run into, it sounds like your machine might not support SSBOs. Um, but we're going to get to that a little later and we're going to change some things. So it should be working with, uh, yeah, we're working with a few tweaks we're going to do later. But first, um, yeah, so last week we were going to do HDR stuff and um, then we got a bit distracted because we looked at uh, gamma correction um, because it kind of made sense that like, unless we're getting sensible values, uh, like color values, light values to, to start with, um, the HDR stuff really didn't make much sense. Um, so we had to dive into that. So what I'd like to do first, as I'm going to see if I've remembered this stuff, I'm going to try and monologue out what that is. And then we're going to dive into um, this tutorial over here, which I'll put a link into the chat in just a second. It's the Learn OpenGL HDR um, tutorial. We're going to work through this. I haven't looked at it yet, so um, hopefully it's good. Uh, let's have a look. So the links from last time... Um, this was the gamma correction thing we looked at last time. Uh, but I didn't find that one that helpful in the end. I found it kind of confusing compared to this one here from Cambridge in Color. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, these are, these are in last week's links. And I'll try and remember to put them in this one as well. Um, and then finally, the HDR tutorial we're going to be working through is here. Um, or you can just browse to learnfgl.com and browse under advanced lighting to HDR. So, let's start with the gamma correction. Um, oh yeah, if you're wondering what's going on over here, there's a little box with some balls and a light in it, which we're going to play with later. I'm going to max that light out and make it very hard to see what's going on. But anyway, that's there. So, yes, gamma correction. So, in the beginning, machines were slower, and it was still kind of good. Um, so people were building a lot of games and one of the things is when it came to lighting and materials and stuff like this there was a lot of fudge factors so you'd mess with a specular to get the right result you wanted you'd change different things in different ways uh, in order to get things working in a given scene um, the problem was then when you would take a model that you've tweaked for one scene and move it to another it didn't always work very well because the lighting conditions were different you had different fudges different bodges going on in a different place and yeah they, you could have those kind of conflicts and so there's been a push, the industry has already gone this way, but there's a while back, there was a push to move to um, basically using more realistic uh, lighting equations, taking things from physics, approximating them so we could actually run them in real time, and then using those. Because the advantage would be, if it's modeled on the real world, um, you should be able to swap out physically based uh, lighting and materials and things like this and get good results. One other thing that becomes very interesting is um, how we how we look at light, how we calculate with light, and how we respond to it as people. Um, because humans, uh, their eyes developed for to be practical, not to be precise. So we have this interesting quality that um, let me just move this cursor there. An interesting quality that we're a lot more sensitive to changes in. Uh, the dark end of um, the brightness range than we are to the bright end. So, like, if you're in a cave and a very small change in light amount actually perceived by us is quite a large change. And, like, say light amount here, I'm talking about actual quantity of photons hitting the object. Because in, like, physics, when we're thinking physically, it's like, hey, you got a million photons hitting something? Okay, now there's two million? Right, that's twice as bright. That's twice the, like, twice the radiance. I'm not sure I'm using that term right, so I'm kind of glitching around it. Um... But that's not how the human eye responds to it. Um, what's kind of interesting, let's see if we can get the doodling working over here. So if we have a little graph, and this is actual quantity of photons hitting, or like physical. I'll just put photons in lieu of anything else. The amount of photons hitting is going to go up. Now at the beginning, this is obviously, this is, and this is a human perception. So this is what the human sees as brightness. So at the beginning, as brightness, um, like as more photons hit, we actually see it as quite a large um, increase in brightness, even for in a small number extra, uh, small increase in actual radiance, actual number of photons. I'm just going to say number of photons in lieu of anything else. So 
we respond fairly quickly um, for a while and then it kind of curves off. There's this big curve. Not like that. I'm so good with pens. You can tell I'm a coder. Um, and it just kind of sails off there. And the reason is, I mean, like, it's important to be able to like have some sensitivity in the dark places. You need to be able to um, tell one thing from another in, a, in the dark. It's from a survival point of view. But the advantage of being able to tell the difference precisely from a bright day and a really bright day isn't as high. There's not mu as much of an advantage there. And so the body just seems to have evolved to have this kind of response curve to brightnesses. So down here, um, a very small increase, let's just say from here to here, we map that up, right? Perceived wise is a very large change in brightness. Whereas over here, the same size change is almost imperceptible in brightness. So you can't just double the number of photons and, and humans and expect a human to see double the brightness. They don't. Um, and this curve describes roughly how they respond to that. Um, so that's interesting. But then we get into the business of um, cameras. Well, really, it's kind of in, it's obviously of interest to anyone who's making any kind of bulb or display. Because if you're trying to make something look twice as bright to a person, you need to know actually how much power to throw out of that screen or how much to th power to throw out of that bulb. But we get to cameras. Cameras, like the, your ideal camera is a light, just a light capture device. Here's a scene, here's all the photons coming in, and we just want to capture exactly that information. And let's say we have a nice camera and um, the response is one to one. So twice as many photons, um, the number like the, the color value gets twice as large. Awesome. But it's actually not a great idea to store it um, in that fashion. Or at least, I mean, there, there are some uses for that, which we'll get to. Um, but seeing as humans are really insensitive to really bright, like to changes at the really bright end, um, you don't want to use the same amount of storage. Like you don't want to prioritize the same number of bits for this part of the brightness. I, want to, I keep wanting to say spectrum. What is it like ramp, curve, I don't know, uh, compared to this bit. And so what we do is we um, we remap the values, we distort them, we fuck them up in a way um, that is similar to how the human eye would respond to it. So we're, we're giving more bits to this part of the curve rather than this bit. And again, it's kind of like with, with any form of compression and things like this, when we um, chop off the bits that the humans can't hear. I mean, it, it makes sense as well with a camera. We're not storing all of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're not getting x-rays and radio and ultraviolet and all that stuff that humans can't see. We're just capturing the bit that's important. And so given finite space and all this kind of stuff, it makes sense to encode things in a way um, where we're prioritizing based on a human looking at it. And that's all well and good. But of course, if we've stored things in a fucked up way, this is called gamma encoding, when you store them in this kind of mushed up way, um, then they're going to have to be unfucked at some point. And happenstance and strange stories, um, this is what this ends up what's happening in monitors. When they built the CRT, like the old screens, um, there was a kind of interesting property that the amount of photons coming out of the thing um, wasn't like linear with the amount of power going in. So if you doubled the voltage, it didn't mean double the brightness. In fact, at low powers, a little bit uh, like increasing the voltage didn't increase let's see if i've got color here here we go didn't increase um the number of photons coming out that much but then uh let's see if i can kind of do this yeah. something like that but later on doubling the voltage would more than double the number of photons coming out in fact by complete coincidence which is very strange um it's almost the exact inverse of the human um, eye response. So what it means is to a human doubling the voltage or doubling the power we're um, putting out of the CR, like putting into the CRT um, did seem to double the brightness because it was the exact mirror. It was the exact increase that we needed for a human to perceive uh, a, like a doubling or a linear increase um, in brightness. So that was a really interesting quality. Complete fluke. But when we got around to LCDs, they didn't have this quality. So they built it in. There was a post-process step. I'm not sure. If, I assume it happens in the monitor. But you guys can tell me maybe 
if it happens earlier in the pipeline, maybe in the GPU. But there is a post-process stage that happens um, where they do the unfucking um, that was done by the CRT automatically. And so this is built in. You can't turn this off. So we've got images being captured in this in, in a fucked up way, but which makes a lot of sense uh, biologically. And we've got um, monitors that unfuck them for us. Hooray, excellent. That's all, that's all really good until we guys are trying to make games or something. And the problem with it is um, we, like we mentioned before, are wanting to um, start using like physical calculations, things based on the real world. And for that, um, that's all based on like, yeah, like relative number of photons, actual brightness, rather than what the human perceives. Um, so when we get a texture, when we when we try and pull in some of these images we've been captured, they're all buggered up. They've they've been stored in a way. They've been gamma encoded, and so we have to undo that when we load them in. And the way we do that is uh, we raise it to the power of two point two. So raise the power of two point two, and then then we've got it in um, in our kind of actual number of photons kind of thing because that's what, it's kind of a cool thing about monitors and cameras in general that whole that just idea that an ideal camera an ideal screen would be like a box catching the photons that were at the scene and then this monitor is just another box that blasts exactly the same number of photons exactly the same quality outwards at you so you're just kind of catching a scene and then throwing it at someone's face later i just love that idea Anyway, we've got uh, we've got these textures, which are all fucked up in a special way, and we've unfucked them so we can actually do maths with them. But when we finish like uh, with our shaders and we put out a value, it is always going to go through this step, this um, yeah, this gamma correction step that's built into um, your display. Now, that's an issue because we're not on this card. We haven't we haven't in, we haven't been encoded. Um, we're working with number of photons, essentially. We're working with a physical property. But since we can't turn this post-process off, what we have to do is we have to take our lovely values and we have to push them out this way. We have to... I think I think this is correct to say you, you gamma encode them so that the gamma correction is going to um, be applied by the monitor and you get the correct result out. So, yeah, um, there's a lot of interesting kind of buggering amount going on there and it's it's really cool there is actually i mean it's good that we um store things in this way again it makes file sizes smaller makes for like for the primary use which is people looking at it makes it correct let us do more with that space um if you've ever worked with raw files um those ones are not uh gamma encoded they're just the light values as they came in as far as i know um so you would have to deal with that in i guess photo software afterwards to deal with that, to do that processing. Um, also, you occasionally see things saying like artists work in this because they don't know about blah blah blah, which doesn't seem right either because you want artists working in the space that makes the most sense because they're, they're composing things that are to be looked at, right? So you want them working in the correct space for that. Now, of course, there's a thing where you could have an editor showing you in one space and then you save it um, encoded that like you can save it uh, in a kind of linear. Um, with linear gamma, but yeah, I, I I don't know the details around that so much. And we do use um, things without without this gamma encoding for stuff like um, material maps and things like this, which we'll get to another stream because we'll eventually get round to physically based rendering. But anyway, that is my rough summary of gamma encoding um, and gamma correction, more importantly. So all it ends up being is that when we load things, when we load uh, things in from a texture where we know, like from a PNG or a JPEG or anything like that, we're going to raise it to the power of 2.2. And before we put it out at the very end of our pipeline, um, we're going to raise it to the power of 1 over 2.2. And that's going to encode it back this way so the monitor will um, put it where you want to be. It's kind of like if you wanted to stand somewhere in a room, but you knew there was always a guy who's going to pull you one foot to the right. You would, you would know exactly what to do. You would go to the place that you want to be and you'd step one foot to the left, right? Because you know he's going to come along and pull you one foot to the right and then you'll be where you want to be. That's kind of what we're doing on that final step is we're buggering it a certain way so we know the monitor's going to correct out to the values we wanted to use in the first place. And again, this is not a significant computation-wise 
um, thing. Like, like raising things to the power super cheap, especially if, like where we're do doing things on the GPU. So we're not going to worry about that. I think that made sense. We'll see. Uh, kind of like that's the, got to the point where I feel comfortable with it now. Whether it's completely correct, we'll we'll see. I know the terminology. I'm still very loose with. Um, but we'll get there. But what we actually want to do today is look at HDR. So this is going to be. We're going to just start beasting our way through this uh, tutorial and see what we learn. Okay, so. And once we've gone through this a bit, we'll jump over to the example and we'll start trying this stuff out. Um, and we'll make some tweaks. That might be actually be quite soon. So basically, yeah, we'll, we'll get there in a minute, actually. So let's have a look. Okay, so brightness and color values are clamped between 0 and 1 when stored in the frame buffer. Yep, we've got like, generally our frame buffers, like the default frame buffer when you're putting out to the screen, has got like 8 bits of precision or something like that. So, yeah. Oh, sorry, 8 bits. Oh, that's bullshit. Sorry. It, your, each component is 8 bits. Sorry. Okay. This is um, this at first seemingly innocent statement uh, caused us to always specify light and color values somewhere in this range, trying to make them fit with the scene. Okay, so there's bodging again. Um, this works okay and gives decent results, but what happens if we walk in with a specific? Uh, if we walk in a specifically, a specifically bright area or especially bright area sounds more correct, um, with multiple bright light sources that, as a total sum, exceed 1.0. Okay. The answer is all the fragments that have a brightness or color sum over one get clamped to one which isn't pretty to look at. So like, um, let's uh, let's go in here. I'm gonna just mess with this light for a second. I'm just gonna turn it down to 200. I'm gonna reset the lights. And we can come down, oops, I can fly down in here and we can see the detail on the floor and um, on these balls and stuff like this. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna whack this light value up and reset the lights. Let's actually whack it up even more. Uh, 3,000. And we can start to see that like, we're hitting... Um, we're, we're reaching one on the various components that are involved here. And they're not going any higher. So we're just getting this solid color. And down here you can see what they were talking about. Just Most of this is like around here is just like one. So it's getting completely overexposed, washed out. And it's being clamped as well, so it's not even correct in any way. Um, so that's not nice. Due to the large number of fragment um, colors getting clamped to one, each of the bright faces have exactly the same white color in a large reason, causing a significant amount of, um, con uh, yeah, losing a significant amount of detail or giving it a fake look. A solution to this problem would be to reduce the strength of the light sources to ensure no areas of fragments in your scene end up brighter than one. And it's not, because again, you're bodging things and you're using unrealistic lighting parameters. And what would be better is if we allow things to exceed one and then transform them back into the range that our output buffer can handle um, in a way that at least we're not losing too much detail. So what you could do is allow, say, like 0 to 10, and then divide by 10. That would get you in the same range, but it would also look terrible. Um, so we're going to have to be smart about how we do this remapping. So we'll have to see how that goes. And I need coffee. And Metian, yeah, OpenGL 4.1. I don't think SSBOs were there, but we're going to remove that stuff in a short time. So uh, then you'll have a version you'll be able to load. And I'll show you why. It's actually due to a bug in Keppel, I think. I think I'm very sure it's a bug in Keppel. Um, okay, so. Monitors are limited to display colors in the range 0 to 1, but there's no such limitation in lighting equations. By allowing fragment colors to exceed 1, we have a much higher range of colors available to work with, um, known as high dynamic... So, yeah, sorry. A much higher range of colors still available to work in, known as high dynamic range. Um and the standard thing is called like what we have normally, that's between zero and one, that's low dynamic range. So in contrast to that. Um, with high dynamic range, bright things can be really bright, dark things can be really dark, and details can be seen in both. So that's cool. Um, so yeah, even though we haven't got an output buffer that can handle really high precision, um, like, sorry, as long as, like, because even though our default frame buffer can't handle uh, really high precision, um, we can use 
like frame buffers um, that have textures in them. And those could be floating point textures. So then we've got all that like range of values we can use there. So we're not being clamped at all. So yeah, high dynamic range was originally only used for t photography, where a photographer takes multiple pictures of the same scene with varying exposure levels, capturing the large range of values. These are combined um, in ways that allow you basically yeah to see this to get stuff from the the um, the darker images and the brighter images and and combine them together. Sorry, let's let's actually see how they say it rather than my hack. I thought I was gonna be able to say that fluently, but it turned into a complete fucking mess. These combined images form an HDR image where a large range of details are visible based on the com com on the combined exposure levels or a specific exposure it is viewed with. For instance, the image below shows a lot of detail at brightly lit regions with a low exposure, um, like this little window here. Uh, but these details are gone with a high exposure. A high exposure now reveals a great amount of detail in the darker regions that weren't previously visible. So. Let's get best of both worlds and then mix them in some smart way. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of similar to how the human eye works because um, the human eye can adapt to brightnesses, like contracting your iris and stuff like this, let in less light, um, and that's smart. Okay, so high dynamic range rendering works a bit like that. We're going to allow a much larger range of color values, and then we're going to transform all these HDR values back to low dynamic range of 0 to 1. Uh, this process of converting HDR to LDR is known as tone mapping. Right, so these, this is tone mapping, and we're going to see a bunch of that, actually. And a large connection of tone mapping algorithms exist. I've also heard them called operators when just expressed as functions. The aim to preserve most HDR details during the conversion process. These tone mapping algorithms often involve an exposure parameter um, that selectively favors dark or bright regions. That's cool. I've tried to use some of these things before and I've failed miserably. So I'm really interested to see how this goes. When it comes to real-time uh, rendering, high dynamic range allows us not only to exceed the low dynamic range and preserve more detail, but also give us the ability to specify a light source intensity by their real intensities. For example, the sun has a much higher intensity than something like flashlight, uh, so why not configure the sun as such? This allows us to properly configure the scene's lighting with more realistic lighting parameters, something that wouldn't be possible with LDR rendering. It's really cool when you get into the physical stuff, there's tons of resources online um, for just the actual light values of different kinds of bulbs from all over the world. Just all this information on how um, materials, like, yeah, different properties of materials, different properties of lights and things like this. And suddenly you have all that information you can just pull in. Like, and it has to be treated a little, but again, you're, you're able to use more physical stuff. And that's cool. Um, so yes, floating point frame buffers. So we had a little look at this. I remember, I know we had a little look at this last week, but I felt like going through it again, getting it all fresh, especially after going through the tone mapping stuff again, because my head feels in a little better place. We'll see. As soon as we, as soon as we get to the new stuff, how I just completely fall over. But it'll be fine. It'll be fine. So to implement high dynamic range rendering, we need some way to prevent colors getting clamped at each fragment shader run. When frame buffers use a normally normalized fixed point uh, color format like GLRGB as their color buffer's internal format, OpenGL automatically clamps values between 0 and 1 before storing them in the frame buffer. This is RGB uh, 8 is a shorthand for that one. Uh, this operation holds for most types of frame buffer formats except for floating point formats uh, that are used for extended range of values. Yes, so... When the internal format of a frame buffer's color buffer is specified with the F at the end, like these guys, um, the frame buffer is known as a floating point frame buffer and can store floating point values outside of that range. Yeah, just regular old floats. So large negative numbers, large positive numbers, all fine. To create a floating point frame buffer, the only thing we need to do is change that format parameter. And for us, it is also very similar, uh, very simple rather. What did I just do? I just jumped up, didn't I? Nope, I jumped down. Where are we? Aha, here we are, frame buffers, cool. So, make, texture. Uh, initial contents are gonna be nil. Dimensions are gonna be whatever the dimensions are gonna be. So, I don't know. Yeah, 64 by 64. 
don't know why I always get end up thinking about that. It doesn't matter. One by one. Who gives a shit? Right. And we just say, um, we can say float. Or we can say vec2, vec3, vec4. Um, and then we'll have a texture. Um, then we can do defa uh, temp0. And then from that, we can have, we have a look at things like it's element type. And you can see that even though we specified it as a vec4 here, um, that was the Lisp, um, or the, rather the CFFI type that we were using. It got converted um, by Keppel into the correct format for OpenGL, um, which in this case is a 32-bit floating point number. Of course, you can use these things directly. Um, so you can say, doo, 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 like this. You can also specify the 16 um 16 bit alternative that's a lower precision of loading point um yes so it's nice and easy to do in keppel it's basically the short version it works unlike some of the stuff oh, it's some interesting things i did actually get some stuff done on saturday though which was really nice saturday and sunday i um added what was it it was more support for consuming um frame buffer IDs and VAOs made in other libraries. So getting the GL IDs and turning them into Keppel objects. So then you can wrangle them in the normal way. It was uh, it was cool. We used it to uh, get CL Fond working, which is uh, Shimera's, one of Shimera's text rendering type libraries. And it was, it was cool. I've got gist for that actually somewhere. I should put that, put that somewhere visible. Rokoros. These series are great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's lovely to have you guys here. I mean, I've been bumbling around with this stuff on my own otherwise, and I, I really like, I, lo I love the company, and I love the feedback you guys give. It's uh, it's really cool. Keep shit talking, and keep calling me out on stuff, because it's it's good fun. Okay, so we've made that. Um, and this is when they've got around to talking about how many bits things are normally um, normally have. So then we say, with a floating point color buffer attached to a frame buffer, we now render the scene into this frame buffer knowing color values won't get clamped between 0 and 1. Cool. In this tutorial's example demo, we first render a, uh, a lighted scene, a lit scene, into this floating point frame buffer and then display the frame buffer's color buffer on a full screen quad. It looks a bit like this. So we should probably do that. Now this is a good time for us to jump back into the code and unscrew some things so Metian can build as well. So my original plan was I wanted to do something roughly like they had down here, where they had like multiple lights. See this? Yeah, this all blown out at the end, and then they had a few lights down here. And that looked kind of cool. Um, and so what I did was I originally tried with an, a UBO, but then I tried with the SSBO. Um, I defined a struct for a light, for a point light. I defined a struct for a light set, which has an array of three point lights. Um, I then made a originally a UBO, which is just ex it's the same format. Um, we're making a SSBO, passing in information for our lights. So what you see here is position vec three, color vec three, uh, strength float. So position, color, strength, position, color, strength, position, color, strength. Those are going to be our three lights. And then down in our shader, which I've been screwing around with. Um, what we did is we would iterate through these and diffuse power would start at zero, diffuse power, and then we would calculate the light, um, the, the light strength, the, the kind of color contribution from the light um, for each of the point lights in the um, light set. So this is how you pass that in. Unfortunately, stuff has gone wrong and I can show you what's happened as well, which is really annoying. Uh, let's let's have a look. How do I do this? If I got here, remove this vec three, and I put this p light. Where is it? Color um, light. There we go. Right. See how that's yellow? That's meant to be white. It's all a bit off-putting. That did not go well. And I was confused by that, and I'm not sure if it's going to show it now. So what I did was I um. I wrote this uh, GPU function here, and we have that lovely feature in Keppel where we can just call a GPU function and it will marshal values to and from so we can have a look at what the output is. Um, so what I do is I call watt with the lights and it freaked out. Why did it freak out? Continue. One second. <laughs> What's lights? 
yeah, we got an SSBO of a light set. We should be able to pass in a light set. Oh yeah, sorry, I've done it wrong. I need to pass it in like a, a, a uniform. So that is, hmm. Notice how we've got the uh, red and green components are on, on full and this is not. The other time uh, that I tried this, I got um, a, not a number here or a float infinity and stuff like this. Basically, it's boogered. Because if you look here, this is what the color is meant to be. So this is for light zero. For light one, um, I got red and it's meant to be green. And for light two, I got, what did we get here? Yeah, so this one is is green instead of, it's just very confusing. So I'm not sure what screwed up. And I was thinking originally it was to do with the layout, which it probably is. But I was surprised because the strengths work. And this is correct. And this is correct. So if we get, um, if we go and look, uh, light set, no, not, sorry, not light set, light strength. We can see that's zero, which it should be. Uh, the first one should be 3,000. So let's put this back to zero and see, 3,000. So that bit is at the right point in memory. But some of the other stuff isn't. So I'm not really sure what's going on. It could be some cock up in some upload in uniform uploading stuff. It could be a mistake in uh, handling the different layout kinds. I tried this with um, standard 430 and standard, like, so SSBOs with standard 430, and I tried it with UBOs with standard 140. I got exactly the same problem on both. So something is off. I don't know what it is. But we'll get to that. Regardless, what it means is this stuff basically isn't useful to us right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this and I'll reintroduce it another time. Um, we are going to go in here and instead of doing this, we're going to remove all this code. And the diffuse power is going to be just calling it for one light that we're going to make up. So we're going to make a light, make P light. Oh, we actually, we actually want to keep some of that code from before. Uh, just paste it. Boop. It's around here somewhere. There we go. We want to keep P light. There we go. Du, 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 du. Right, that guy. We are going to, where are we? Light is going to be make light. We're going to pass in a position, zero, four, zero. We're going to pass in a color, um, one, one, one. And we're going to pass in a strength, which was, let's just start with 800. Um, doesn't really matter. And then diffuse power is going to be calling calculate light, which is this function up here, which takes the fragments position, the fragments normal, and the light we're interested in. Now, hopefully when I recompile that, it breaks. Yes, that's exactly what I enjoy, things breaking, because it's meant to be P light. Uh, yeah, that's better. Say continue, and now we're back. And the nice thing as well is we don't have to re-upload, so we can just change things um, and start seeing how it's gonna work. So, we've got this. Uh, there's a few more things we need to remove because there's code elsewhere that was using this. So we can remove uh, this uniform here for lights. When I do that, it's going to freak out um, with this error because um, there's a draw function somewhere that was expecting to upload the lights. So, da, 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 da. oh, oh yeah, we don't. There was an earlier error. There's actually a compilation error because we don't have that anymore. Now we get an um, unknown key argument for lights. Um, so if we go to game step and we go to draw, I know this is the function which was using it. And it's, it's fresh in my head just because I added this light code right before the stream, then found the bug, then realized we're going to have to remove it. So that's done. Um, and also in play... There's reset lights. There we go. Okay, so that should be... That should be it. Um, is there anything else to do? Maybe not. Continue. 
do a quick CLS just to see. Yeah, we cleared the screen and it came back, which means everything's still running. Um, we're not using SSBOs now. We're not using UBOs. So it should be fine for Metian to be able to run now, which is cool. Um, remove uh, light SSBO for now. So let's push that. Don't worry, Marianne, I'm getting there. I'm going to push. It's just got to work first. Standard 430, where's that? Standard 430. That is true, that is on the layout. Um, that won't matter in this case because the only place we construct this struct is inside the shader. And inside here, it the layout doesn't matter at all. But it's only important for the, um, the buffers and for when you're uploading the... Um, GPU function has to know how it's used. But we could remove that as well. It's not a bad idea. But, ah, we'll leave it. It shouldn't cause you a problem. If it does, I'm very sorry. Uh, but you can just remove it. So, I didn't mean to close that file. I'm going to need that. But we're, we're set up now. We have a thing where we can change the light and we can do stuff. Now, we need to render this into something. So let's do what we normally do in these situations, is make a frame buffer, and um, we've actually got a bunch of these still left over from other streams. So, we're going to, yeah, I'm going to do all this stuff, so one second, let's bring up the REPL. Where do we make an FBO? So we make an FBO here. It's got one attachment, um, one color attachment, sorry, and one depth attachment. Um, but we want to set the element type. We're going to turn this into a list. So the element type to be RGBA. And what does the tutorial use? They're using 16-bit, so let's go along with them. Why not? And what happens now? That should be it. We don't specify the dimensions, so it should be just taken from the standard viewport. Um, let's call reset and see what happens. Yep, there we go. So now if we look at scene FBO, um, we can get the FBO attachment. Oh, no, it's just called attachment, isn't it? Attachment. I can't type. Um, scene FBO, and we'll get the first color attachment. And we can see that what we have there is a GPU array that's backed by a texture that's using RGB 16F, um, and it has these dimensions. It's also recreated the scene sampler, um, which is sampling that texture, and apparently a depth sampler as well. If we need that, I don't think we will. But anyway, so now we can render into this FBO, and that's what we're going to do. So we will um, uh, with FBO bound. We're going to put our FBO there. Um, we're going to wrap that around our rendering code. Oops. I'm just going to clear the FBO. So that's done. And so we clear the FBO, and then we're going to draw into it. We're going to draw everything into it. So everything's gone now, because we're not rendering it to the screen anymore. We're rendering it into that buffer. And what's fun about run rendering it to that buffer is we're rendering it, um, yeah, as floating point values. Now, one thing that's not in the tutorial, I expect, that I'm going to go change, is that um, right before the end of that fragment shader, I was gamma encoding. Um, so I was raising it using a function. Let me just recompile this buffer. Um, raising it to the power of 1 over 2.2. And I was doing that like we discussed before. So to bugger up the values. So when the screen transforms it, we get linear um, values. We get the values we were intending. But the whole reason we're writing this into this frame buffer 
is so we can post process it in another stage. So we don't need to be doing this yet. We just need to take the color and treat it as is. So let's assume that's gone right. Um, I mean, we could pull this buffer, but it's gonna be kind of hard to see. Hmm, I wonder actually. Let's have a look. I might have a function for this. Dirt save as image texture. Cool. Um, let's see. So we do attachment and we do attachment text, which will give us the texture. And then we take, idiot, come here. Uh, take this, put that there, and then we save it somewhere. Uh, let's save it here. Call it foo.png. Let's see if that works. Bah! TGA, BMP, or TDS. Okay. That did not save her. Oh, yeah, of course, because we're trying to save a floating point buffer to a... Yeah, that won't work. <laughs> Never mind. Let's not pay that any attention. That was interesting anyway. Uh, so, yes, we've, <laughs> we've stored things as floating point values. Um, so it's not a standard image format. That was not going to work. But let's see what the next bit of the tutorial is. Oh, yeah, they were drawing it to a quad, weren't they? Oh, we've done this a thousand times, right? So let's let's make that... Let's rewrite that code anyway. Code we probably know by heart by now. Which is... Defun G... Quad... Well, this is going to be our vertex shader. Um, and it takes a... Vert, which is a vec2. And it returns two values. The first one's going to be passed to GL as the position. So we just... Um, take the vert and put 0 and 1 at the end. The other one we're going to use as UV coordinates. So what we're going to do is we're going to, it's in the range, we're going to remap it from minus well, its current range, which is minus 1 to 1 to 0 to 1, which means we need to take the vert and divide it by 2, so we'll times by 0 0.5, and add 0 0.5. And that's that function done. And then we do defund g quad f. We're going to use this as our fragment shader. It takes a uv, which is a vector 2, and it takes a uniform, which is a, just going to call it SAM because it's going to be a sampler, which is 2D. We're going to call texture on SAM with the UV. And that's the two things we're going to use as shaders. Remember in Keppel, um, we can use GPU functions both as regular functions and as stages if they adhere to certain properties, which is very nice. You can mix and match and play with things. Right, so now we're going to go quad V takes a vec2. These are the signatures of the two GPU functions that we want to use as our stages. So why do I call that pipeline? Um, oh, yeah. Quad P line, why not? And then Devon splat, which is our quad function. It's going to take a sampler. Uh, we're going to call map G on quad P line. Now we do have helper functions for stuff like this, but seeing as we're going to be modifying this code very soon, I think um, it didn't seem like a good idea to just use those helpers because we're going to have to do this soon anyway. One helper we will use is from the library Nineveh, which we can just say get v, what's it, quad stream v2. And that's going to be our vertices. It's just a quad. Okay, so now we've got this. We can go back to here just after we clear and we can say splat and we're going to pass in the scene sampler and if nothing happens which is rather disturbing did i do something silly it's kind of hard to check if it's working or not when Let's do this. Oh, uh, just want to know if this thing's still running at all. It doesn't seem to be, does it? There it is. Okay, I must have set hit abort on one of the exceptions rather than continue. That was dumb. Never mind. We can do this. Now when we clear, it's gone. And then when we uncomment this, hopefully we can see it again. Cool. So we wrote in this one uh, that we drew the scene and we drew it into this FBO. 
and then in the next step we read from that um, buffer and we just displayed it so we read from the sampler and we return that as the color so now we can zip around we doing stuff yeah and then so yeah that's that's the bit we needed what else was i going to check hopefully the uh, yeah uh where are we going render let's get rid of render from there and focus it again hopefully it means we can still go up here and do things like change the amount of light that's good and everything works so that's our two-stage pipeline that we've got now let's have a look <laughs> apparently i've got to push again okay so don't need that because that was garbage um yes so this is what is it what is it what did we just do i don't know uh yeah two stage pipeline that was a very good point thank you for poking me this is this is exactly the time i should commit things and i don't and then i trash stuff and then i don't know how to get back to working state again they get all confused right so where are we time wise oh we're not even through the first hour this is awesome we've got loads of time just as well because i'm gonna get confused soon we know it it's coming right so da 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 they bind the frame buffer so they can render into it then they um then they do some rendering between here and there so they do clear oh sorry they bind the frame buffer they clear like we do they render the scene they unbind the frame buffer um then they turn on the next GL program, they um, activate this texture point, they bind the texture, and then they render the quad. Um, and this is where they're doing their four point lights. We could hack in a couple more lights to be fair. That wouldn't be hard. Actually, let's do that. Whoop, we'll go up here. Very dark. Um, light zero, whoop, whoop. light one. Okay, this one is going to be uh, green. Damn it, I wanted a green light, and I never got one. Why does these things always happen? Right, okay, it's going to be 100 strong, and it's going to be at a height of... So, this thing is... How high is it? Play with that lisp. It is... We make a box and is this the position or is this the yeah the size is over here it's 60 tall okay so we'll put it at 50 um and it's green and it's strength 100 and let's put it at minus uh 10 minus 10 to put it a little closer to that wall and now diffuse power zero diffuse power one this is going to be for light zero and light one and then when we're summing up the amounts of light, it's very simple. We just add them together. So diffuse power zero, uh, diffuse power one. Again, not sure those are good terms, but whatever. And then we can see down here <laughs> a little green light. Let's see if I can turn around without losing track of everything. There it is. And there's a little bit of color right there on the top of that. Let's give it a little more. More oomph, a little more oomph. Let's put it up to 300, and then you should might be able to see. I can now see. Like this is actually a really good test because when I'm looking at this screen, I can see th these three spheres all have green on them and the blue down on the edge of this. But when I look at the preview on OBS over here, it's really dark. Like I can't see any of that distinction down on these guys, pretty much. So could you tell me if you? Um, can see the green on here, here, and here, or if it's as dark for you as it is in my preview. It'll be really interesting to know. And uh, Nafdez says you should use the undo for tree for Emacs. I do all the time. It's fantastic. In fact, I did earlier in the stream. 
it's one of those things that when I go away from Emacs, I go completely insane because I will I I live in the undo tree. I, I know that at least like three different things that I've got in that stack, and I know how to wind back to them. And oh oh, it's just never never going back from that. Um, maybe push the two lights. That's not a bad idea. Can't see the green there, Sergeant Queef. Thank you very much. That's exactly what I needed to know. How about now? Um, Sergeant Queef, I never quite understood the undo tree. Ah, oh, it's awesome, man. I, I, I... Kind of like your git history. You're just walking back through time. And you can undo your undos as well. And that point, like whenever you undo something, that's an action too. So you can then walk up and down that tree. Can get confusing, but oh, oh I love it. A faint ball from Metigan. Hopefully we can see those a bit better now. That is really good to know. So it's actually quite dark on your end. Um, so that is... <laughs> right, let's, uh, let's whack up these lights a bit then. So I'll put a 3,000 light down the bottom. I'll put a 2,000 light here. Um, let's put actually a 5,000, 4,000, 5,000 light down here. It's brutal! Look at that, it's all washed out and these colours are all buggered. But we've got lights. We've got multiple lights. Now we can go up here. Oh, that's as well. You guys can't see... Uh... I mean, this background color is... I put it dark just to help with... Um... Because it wasn't the focus, everything outside this box. I wanted it to look dark, but let's... Um... Oh, God, this is going to be so horrible. Huh. That didn't seem to respond. Oh no, it did. Ugh. Yeah, see, that's to me is quite a a medium grey, and it still looks kind of black on the stream. Anyway, let's see what's going on. Default Twitch streams use 420. If you want to keep some more details in color, then there's a filter for that in OBS. Dude, that's really good to know. Awesome. Also, what's 420? <laughs> and where can I find these things? Oh, man, I'm going to have to Google that. Uh, Love Like Santos. Again, good to see you because I didn't see you earlier in the stream. And thank you. That's fucking great information. Yeah, damn. Right, cool. But I should finish this. Let's let's see where we are. Okay, so we've got a, we're rendering some stuff. We've got two lights. Um, this is what they've written as well, which is similar to us. A simple pass-through fragment shader. So they're taking the texture coordinates, taking the sampler, reading from there, taking the RGB, putting it in the HDR color, and then returning it. Um, yeah, we've got something very similar. Oops. If we go back to our render file... Oh, yes, before we get any further, sorry, Metian, you're right. Uh, we did two stage lights, now, yeah, two stage pipeline, now it's two lights. Um, boop. Ciao. Right. Um, where is it? Here. Let's do it the same way they are. But let's start. Call is swizzle. X, Y, Z. And then we're going to return color with one. Fine. Um, okay, so we see the result. Exactly how it should be before. So it's still getting clamped, of course. Like, that's what we want to see, which is down the bottom. Um, is that... We're getting, like, really hard whites here. We're getting really... Um, Hard blue here, and everything's kind of faint. And we'll, as we get further away, things will be faint. Um, it'd be nice to actually see a value that is over one, just to prove to ourselves that they, that definitely is happening. Um, 
So what we'll do is we will write a little function um, just to do, actually we can call, oh, that's great. See, this is one of the times that I just like, I really like Keppel, because what we'll do is we'll call the function we're using as a fragment shader. Um, we're gonna pass in a vec2. So we'll do, um, let's just do 2020 for now. Um, and we're gonna pass in the sampler, which is the scene sampler, which is called Sam. And that's it. Ah, oh, there we go. Straight away, we've got values that are higher than um, one. So all of these are gonna be clamped, right? So how, uh, oh, wait a sec. Oh, <laughs> I'm putting in silly coordinates. Uh, 0.1, 0.1. Let's look at 0, 0. I think all these values are high. I'm finding that a little suspect, actually. Oh, there we go. Now we got some low values. I'm guessing we're 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Yeah, so we're around here somewhere. We're in something that's in the normal range. So this isn't getting clamped. There's no red component, which makes sense. Because um, this is a blue ball with a white light and a green light. And we've got a little bit of green, um, a little bit of blue, a little bit of green. Interesting. Oh, yeah, because the blue ball, the only minute. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, because that would be the... Yeah, I guess there's no red component or very little in this texture. Anyway, yeah, that's cool. So, oh, I like that. Anyway. 420 is the chroma format the H264 MP4 stream uses. They are clamping the color space. Ah, oh. color space. That's another thing I really need to learn about. We'll probably do those on a stream another day. I have a lot of functions for converting them in Nineveh, but I don't understand them very well. Um, I did some stuff in the REPL. A greenish frame. Okay. Yeah, you might want to poke the, uh... what did I do in the wrapper? Oh yeah, I mean, I changed the uh, background color, but that was it. Um... Yeah, you're right, you are correct. Right, da -da 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 -da. Ooh, more questions, sorry, I missed some, missed some stuff higher up. Garcia! Hey guys, sorry for interrupting. I'm reading and doing exercises from A Gentle Intro Introduction to Symbolic Computation. How did you find that? I haven't read that one. Um, is the best way to learn Lisp? That's a good question. The way I did it was I had a friend set up Emacs for me because I didn't know how um, on my laptop. And then I, I was very lucky. I had some holiday. So I went off and I had Land of Lisp and I worked on that for, um, yeah, basically a week and got through the majority of the book and it was really good. And it was kind of a few a few things in there started clicking. Um, one of the pieces of advice, actually from the same friend who set up the laptop, just coding advice in general, was when you go to a new language, one of the things that's quite nice to do, and there's so many of them already, but making a vector math library or something like that is actually a kind of fun exercise because you can get it absolutely right. The formulas are simple and they're written down. It gets you to start dealing with objects and values inside whatever language you're looking at. So you start learning what the languages view are on different data types. Uh, if you want to think about performance, it's a good avenue for doing that kind of vector math is a place where you might want to actually care about performance a little. Um, so you can start looking at that. It was It's quite a nice avenue. I mean, it is how I started um, on this as well. Um, yeah, that eventually, it was the math stuff that then I built kind of Keppel alongside. I was doing the GL stuff. And then the maths part spun off into RTG math, which is the maths library I put out now. Um, yeah. And the Lisp is underrated, and there's a very fun way to learn. Yes, it's awesome. There's a... Um, Wait. <laughs> Sorry, Sergeant Queef has just said something completely insane. When did you add 720p? What? I can finally... What? I only stream in 1080? 
have you not been getting HD streams from like YouTube and stuff? I'm so confused. If you're joking, I really hope you're joking. Jeez, that would be awful because this thing looks terrible in anything less than 1080. Um, but yeah, it's um, the learning stuff. Oh, it's cool, man. Just um, then, what did I do? The GL was kind of the avenue for everything for me, like because I knew what I wanted to do. It was a uh, oh, welcome to the chat room. I guess I've just been out and back again. Good old Twitch. Sergeant Creep says, no, it's been locked to 1080p earlier. Oh, okay. I wanted 720 because I don't have a 1080p monitor. Oh, man, I hope this is okay to watch in that format. I didn't like it, but that's... Uh, I can't make it any smaller. It makes me sad. Anyway. Yeah, we were talking about tutorial stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question, though, man. It's, it's always nice hearing people's input on that one. Okay. Large portions of it are completely white, like this. Um, losing all lighting details in the process exceed one. As we directly transform HDR values to LDR values, it's as if uh, we had no LDR enabled in the first place. Sorry, no HDR enabled in the first place. What we need to do is fix this transform. To fi what we need to do to fix this is transform all the floating point color values back into the 0 to 1 range without losing any of the details. We need to apply a process called tone mapping. We said that earlier. We're good. Right. Tone mapping, it's the same process we just talked about. Uh, the simplest tone mapping algorithm is one known as Reinhard tone mapping. It involves dividing the entire HDR color values to LDR color values and, and evenly balancing them all out. The Reinhard tone mapping algorithm evenly spreads all brightness as values onto LDR. We included Reinhard um, tone mapping into previous fragment shader and also add a gamma correction filter for good measure. Gamma correction, we looked at that before including the use of um, sRGB textures. So notice that he's loading a texture. Well, they're loading in a texture. Um, ah, okay. They're using an sRGB texture, which means when they load it in, it's being transformed um, for them automatically. The gamma is being adjusted, like made linear automatically. So they don't have to do it, though we do. And we do that in our first stage. Here, when we say gamma correct. Raising to the power of 2.2. .2. Um, so you can see here they are dividing it. So HDR color divided by HDR color plus one. That's what their Reinhard tone mapping operator is. So let's let's borrow this. And then at the end, they're doing the gamma correction. So let's let's start with that actually, because we've got gamma correct, uh, gamma encode. Ah, see, that's this is this is where I know I'm using the um, term wrong. And the reason I've been using it wrong is that when have I got that file still open? Probably not. Um, uh, color. God damn it, what was it? Um, oh, come on, Chris. What was I thinking of? Um, Cambridge in color, there it is. Ha ha! Buttons. When they talked about the camera encoding um, the image, the recorded uh, value in the file, they talked about it as gamma encoding. So not storing it linearly. So how it's stored in the file, right? That was gamma encoding, pushing the curve that way. The gamma correction was pushing it the other way using um, this inverse curve. So raising it to the one of the 2.2. So I've put, oh, have I done that wrong then? No, that's right. So, sorry. Oh, wait, hold on. No, yeah. So raising it to the power of 2.2 .2 is the gamma correct is this direction. Raising it to one over 2.2, .2, I think is this way. I got that right. Yes, because you're bumping it out this way because the monitor's going to do the inverse. 
So basically, my name ain't shit. Um, so sorry about that. So I'm gamma correcting the texture as it comes out, and then I'm saying I'm gamma encoding it before the end. I, sh I need to learn what the correct terms are there and fix them. Uh, but what do these take anyway? They take VEC3s. So this output here, uh, we'll just say gamma encode. That's one of the places I know I'm still off on. Um, is dealing with that. And that's completely <laughs> changed how this scene looks. Holy shit. Um... We might. That's interesting. That actually had a big effect on the stream as well. I'm gonna turn these turn these down a bit because I really hate hit seeing that bright grey in the background. It just looks so weird. There we go. Yeah, I can live with that. Um, where's our lights? Let's whack down the top one a bit. There we go. Cool. All right, where were we? So we gamma encoded it, and then there was that other thing that they mentioned. Da, da, da. Of course, it's not my history yet because it's from here. Reinhard tone mapping. There we go. Let's take this, comment out, and let's make a function for it because we're going to be making a bunch of these, hopefully. Defund G. Reinhard tone map. We take a color, which is a vec3, and then we return the color divided by, whoops, divided by, wrong language, uh, the color plus one. And I actually like in theirs, they call it HDR color, so I'm going to do the same thing. Boop, boop, boop. Just to remind us what we're doing. Okay, so this one's going to look a bit weird, I think. So we do this. Okay. So let's... That was rather anticlimactic. But true to form, we do have the detail back in the floor again. Um, let's crank up that light. Let's put it up to something really high. That looks to me like it's blown out again. Oh dear. <laughs> Strange. If I not use this correctly, Reinhard tone map takes the color we tone map it, we get mapped, we gamma encode it. Let's just make sure that we haven't fucked anything up there. Not really. <laughs> hmm. Not too convinced, to be honest. I'm a little confused. Again, the more we crank that up, because that should be whatever the value is, it should be divided by a value that's slightly bigger than it. So it's always going to get brought down. But how is that? I'm a little confused there. Are we pushing it so far that we're getting floating point problems? I thought so. Hmm, that wasn't as dramatic as I'd hoped it would be. Because even if it's like, again, let's, let's look at what we're doing here. So we're saying, oh, actually, we can just test it. Ah, oh, Keppel, I love you. Why not turn that? We're passing in a vector 3. Um, even if the value is 100,000, 0, and 0, see, it should be brought back within that range. A 
But saying that, though, it can still get right up to 1. So it's being brought back. But these values are still right near 1. So with enough of them nearby, you would still get a lot of um, a lot of white. And we wasn't getting entirely blown out. I mean, even with really high values. So maybe it is working. Let's uh, just... Where was I? I should gamma quick this again. Oh, wait a second. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Hmm. So without it, if we do cull, yeah, it is more washed out when it's that. But still, a lot of them can end up nudging up to... Yeah, so tone mapping applied, we no longer lose any detail in the bright areas, don't we? This is always being done per pixel as well, so it's not taking the whole screen into account. It does tend to slightly favor brighter areas, making darker regions seem less detailed and distinct. Okay. You say so. No, we could also directly tone map at the end of our lighting shader, not needing any floating point frame buffer at all. But as scenes get more complex, you'll frequently find the need to store intermediate HDR results as floating point buffers. So this is good exercise. Yep, it's a simple one too, so it's fine. Another interesting use of tone mapping is to allow the use of an exposure parameter. You probably remember these um, from the introduction of HDR images. In the introduction, the HDR images contain a lot of details visible at different exposure levels. If we have a scene that features a day and night cycle, it makes sense to use a lower exposure at daylight and a higher exposure at nighttime, similar to how the human eye adapts. Um, but such an exposure parameter allows us to configure lighting parameters that work both day and night under um, different lighting conditions, as we only have to change the exposure parameter. A relatively simple exposure tone mapping algorithm looks as follows. Um, so mapped is one minus negative HDR color. Uh, oh, exp, sorry. Yeah, minus negative HDR color times exposure. That's interesting. Let's go have a look. Let's have a play. So we'll call this one, I don't know, defund G, um, expose tone map. HDR color is of X3. And we are going to do this to it. We're going to do minus effect 3 1 exp um, times negate hdr color exposure oh yeah we haven't actually provided an exposure parameter in ours exposure is what do they have? What do they use by default? What's their uh... so let's just start with one, I suppose. Oh yeah, so floats. Um, what we'll do is we will we can just provide another overload of this. So this is the same as an optional, essentially, where we would just use one. So we don't need that. So then we can do expose tone map. And apparently, then if we can do, if we do 0 0.9, and 8, sorry, 0 0.3, 0 0.1. Oh, there we go. 
Then we're controlling things a bit more. Oh, well, that's kind of nice. Yeah. And see, we've still got all this detail here. This is because we didn't clamp. Because we were storing our floating point buffer, when we bring everything back down, that detail's still there. Um, that's really cool. So let's get... should move these walls out, really. They're a bit restricting. Just want a scene where, yeah, needed some floor, need some, some of the balls. And let's, uh, we should pass in a time value so we can animate some things as well. Um, now is a float. And plus sign now. Right, then down here, we will pass in now, which is now. Oh yes, that's going to cost that sign. Negative values, my friend. Um, plus one. And scale this back. Let's do the uh, times 0 0.5 first, and then we'll do the offset down here. Thus... Okay, so that makes a little sense. So even though it was really blown out when we had it towards its actual brightness and things are going getting done everywhere, uh, by using this exposure parameter, then we can control it back to something that makes sense. And we still have all our, we still get to use realistic lighting values. We still get to do all our equations in a sensible way. Um, we just have exposure. That's good. Let me just jump over to the chat because I'm missing some things. Um, Sergeant Queef says, I think it's fine referring to the monitor from earlier. Resolutions, I mean. But I'm not really picky. Oh, that's cool, man. I just find it curious that all of a sudden I can choose 720, 480, 360. Yeah, man. I, I've done nothing. I put very... <laughs> I pay so little attention to Twitch. Like, it's a, it's a service that I use just because it seems to work. And... They do their things. They keep telling me, gift this, like, awards, snaps. Oh, I don't know. Fucking loads of stuff. Get your marketing right. Uh, uh, I don't care. I'm doing Lisp, for Christ's sake. It's a niche of a niche. Right, anyway. Um, Sergeant Queef says, I should get some modern equipment again. All the stuff I've been using this past few years has been the company stuff. They got, oh, me, oh, they got me an office, so now I moved everything there. That makes sense. So now all I have is an old ThinkPad X200. Ah, solid though. While I absolutely love the laptop, even though the battery is getting pretty bad, uh, 1920 by 1080 monitor wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, man, that would be cool. The Meti has talking about the advantages of a second screen, and yes, third screen. Yeah, I, I again had multiple monitors before. I've got this one 40 inch now that I use and I've got the screen over here which is a separate computer but um, for streaming and chats and things like this but yeah. Cool. Right. So yes, high dynamic range. It's worked. Hooray. More HDR. The two tone mapping algorithms shown here are only a few of a large collection um of more advanced tone mapping algorithms, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. Some tone mapping algorithms favor certain looks and intensities um, above others, and some algorithms display both the low and high end exposure colors at the same time to create more colorful and detailed images. There is also a collection of techniques known as automatic exposure adjustment or eye adaptation techniques that determine the brightness of the scene in the previous frame and slowly adapt the exposure parameter such that the scene gets brighter in the dark areas or darker in the bright areas mimicking the human eye you see that in games all the time when you walk out of the building it's like oof, flares out and then like pulls back down again 
Uh, the real benefit of HDR rendering real shows, really shows itself in large and complex scenes with heavy lighting algorithms, as it's difficult to create such a complex demo scene. Oh yeah, but as it is difficult to create such a complex demo scene for teaching purposes while keeping it accessible, the tutorial's demo scene is small and lacks detail. That's fine. It looked better than mine, to be honest. So that's cool. Right now, different links for you. Um, filmic tone mapping operator. This is handy. So let me just give you that link over on your stuff. One second. Filmic tone mapping. Let's go in in the chat. Right. Okay. So this is um, John Hale. He's awesome. He provides a bunch of different... Um, common uh, tone mapping operators. Uh, the most common questions I get in my GDC talk have to do with the tone mapping operators in particular. Um, I've always found that when reading through the presentation for, for code snippets, I always miss something. Like I, I'm a master at that. Those 2.2s can be tricky, yes. So this post is a quick reference for various operators that I talked about. I copied and pasted this code from render monkey scenes and there may be typos. So all of these are provided. And this is interesting as well, because this lumps together the um, tone mapping. It also includes the, um, what am I trying to say? Um, gamma correction is in most of these as well. So you can see power of 1 over 2.2. We recognize that immediately, because that's the gamma correction going on. First off, there is good old linear. All it does is read the linear data to do an exposure adjustment and... Um, it says read the linear data, do an exposure adjustment, and adjust for the monitor's gamma of 2.2. So, read it in. <laughs> Divide, like, times by 16, for whatever reason. That's, like, the exposure adjustment. You would put something there. And, uh, yeah. And then gamma correct. Gamma correct. Whatever the fucking thing is. Gamma adjust. Um, and points out that it doesn't look great without it. Next up is Reinhardt, which is one we looked at. Text color divided by one over text color. Um, then there's Haram. Uh, see, I, I, I'm Harm Peter Dukia curve. Don't know these at all. Sorry, sorry, I meant the name. Um, sorry if I'm pronouncing that very wrong. This version is similar to the um, Cineon node in Digital Fusion. The texture film LUT refers to this TGA file. No power 1 over 2.2 necessary to this TGA file. There's a specific TGA file involved in this. Save. It's a ramp. They've stored a ramp. So they're, they're, there's the curve has just been stored as a texture. You're going to use that as a lookup. Um, as a lookup text, Pond the Pimp. Good to see you, man. So I unfortunately can't stay with you tonight. No worries. <laughs> ah, I didn't know you were here. Oh, there you are. Yeah, you just arrived. How late am I? Very. <laughs> unfortunately, AMV works fine without me. It does indeed. Metian nobly took a step forward to tell me that it was all right. You slacker. No worries, anyway. Um, so yes, we'll probably skip this one just for now because it involves this extra file. So it stored the ramp just as a texture. But again, it's a 1D texture. We know how to work with those. That's fine. Uh, the Hull Richards Dawson one. Um, note that you don't need the PAL um, 1 over 2.2 for this one either. So this is really interesting. Now, I have... Some of these already available. If we go to the works Nineveh tone mapping, you can find Linear, Reinhard. Um, actually, I've already put in a thing that takes a sample of 2.2, so you can pass that TGA file in. Um, Harridge's Dawson one. So let's take this. 
uh, and come over here. And instead of doing the exposed tone map, um, we'll use this. And what do we pass in? We pass in the color as a VEC3 and the exposure as a float. So let's start with one. And we can see that it's pretty bright, as we would expect. Um, and then we are going to turn this down. Let's get it down to 0 0.1. Whoa, that's a very different beast. That looks strange. Am I doing that right? Let's have a look. Actually, what I should do... The thing is, this is uh, DirectX originally, so... Slightly different, I think. It's the way they've written this. Types just looks... Not GLE. Oh no, he said he did it from the Render Man stuff or something. I can't remember what he said actually. <laughs> it was up the top. Damn it, Chris, just look. Um, render Monkey Scenes. Okay. So what do they do? There's some exposure adjustment thing that you can pass in. Um, they're like starting at 16. What the hell? Nope. What I find really strange with this is the blues are just so strong over here. I get really nasty kind of aliasy shit around there. And things still look oh fuck. And things still look bad. Like how how far down do I have to go to get something that looks reasonable? I mean, this is dark now, but I don't know how balanced it is. It's one of those things like we're comparing stuff, but we don't actually know what reality looks like in this case. Or what what are these values I'm passing in? Are they lumens? Like, what, what are the physical qualities? So it's all a bit... Ugh. But anyway, there is an exposure. And there is a color. And then... Yes, so the color is multiplied by the exposure. That's this bit here. Do max of zero and the text color minus 0 0.004. And then, that was that line there. And then we've got this chunk. So we seem to return ours as a VEC3, which I actually kind of like. Then you can do whatever you like with that last component. Um, but this is going to take a little uh, fiddling with to understand. So probably update this now as well. But anyway, like just because at the time. Uh, we didn't have a way of passing floats. There was a lot of overloads for various additions and multipliers and things that weren't there. Um, a bunch of those have been added now, so it should work. Um, so yeah, it's x times 6.2 plus 0.5. What's that? Times x. That's all in brackets there, so that's one bit. So that's that. Divided by, and then we're down to this half. So we've got 6.2 times x again, down here, plus 1.7. Then multiply by x, and then add 0 0.06. Yeah, so that is, that is that does look correct from that code. I'm just maybe it's again. It could be that the values I'm using are complete garbage. It could be that I'm just using it wrong. I don't know. And then oh yeah, this is the chap we worked on Uncharted too. What a game! What a what a fucking great game. Okay, so lots of constants. 
and then a tone map. Um, and again, uh, uh, there's a hard-coded exposure, uh, exposure adjustment there, which I guess we expose. Um, yeah. There's an exposure and an exposure bias. Where did that come from? Exposure bias, which was two in here originally. Don't know what that's for. Um, but let's try using it. Tone map. Um, Uncharted 2. We take the color. Uh, we take the exposure, which we're going to start at 1, as we have with all the others. Um, and with the exposure bias, we'll set that to 2. That is crazy bright. So let's try to start bringing that down. Um, but again, what's that bias? Like, if I set that to 1, it's seeming to wash things out more than darken them. This does seem to work at least. Again, we're, we can see the floor, we can see the balls, we can still see the green in the corner. So there's something going on. Again, it looks a bit washed out in this one, but I, I, I'm fairly sure this is all just down to values I'm choosing. And uh, yeah, I mean, let's just drop these down to 2,100 and just try these again. Wow. Yeah, going all the wrong ways. Cool. Okay, so those that turned down a bit. Maybe we can crank this up to something more sensible and do add a color, which looks uh, washed out, but the, at least the side colors are a bit more maintained. And then mapped. Just feels very washed out. The um, Burgess Dawson one, which we had before. Ooh. Yeah, that went down. Oops. Yeah, just really heavy on those blues. Do not know what's going on there. interesting stuff I don't know man but it's kind of good to know because I, I this is one of the things that I struggled with I would get to this point and like see things like this and just go well I must have fucked everything up because this is really weird um, so yeah I think I need better input data before any of these like proper ones are going to be more useful but we have the exposed tone map and that will actually behave fairly well so Pardon me. There we go. Drop that down. Let's crank up the top light. Yeah. Then we can just drop exposure. To try and bring that into some sensible range. Yeah, so to be able to actually like adjust based on the brightness of screen. So at the moment, this is running independently on every fragment. So you can't really tell anything globally um, about this stuff. So what you could do is you could do one pass where you aggregate information about the scene um, and then have another pass where you, yeah, actually use that information to pick a, a color and stuff like this. I don't know how that works exactly, but um, I guess we'll look into that in another, uh, another stream. It is green. Just like blowing that out really out of proportion and just bringing it down. Actually looked okay. Yeah. Cool. So we're at 2134. And we actually hit the end of the tutorial and looked at some other stuff. So I'm kind of done. Um,
That's the thing, like the, the both of these additional resources. Does HDR rendering have any benefit if Bloom isn't won't be applied? Yes. I mean, like you're just maintaining precision until you decide what part of the brightness range you need. So that's always a benefit. What is tone mapping? How does it relate to HDR? Um, I mean, we can have a peek, can't we? I mean, it doesn't hurt. But at the same time, I'm not expecting. Oh, this is the photography stuff. So, ah, you know what? Well, oh, shit. I actually just quit. That wasn't intentional. Oh, well. But yeah, like. I get a little confused about this point about what to. What to. Oh, wait. I'm still fucking this up. I just realized. Uh, these ones. Uh, Christ. Um, bring that back. Da, 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 really? I don't get the. Uh... What is going on? There we go. I don't get to restore my. Um, oh, fuck it. Let's just go. LearnOpenGL.com and uh, Filmic tone mapping operators. They said really clearly you do not need the power 1.2.2, and I'm still doing it. No wonder things look weird. Okay, so this guy down here needs to go away because we can just use the mapped value as is. Not with our exposed tone map, but with things like uh, Uncharted, for example. That'd be why it's looking washed out as well. Holy shit. Okay. Fuck's sake, Chris. In fact, we'll just... We don't need map now. Bam, bam, bam. Okay, so, color. Let's start with one. Let's start with two. Um, okay, that's a bit... Ooh. What happens if we set it to zero? It's black. Okay, dokey. We won't do that. We'll set it to one. Set it to two, because that's what he had in his card. Let's just bring this down, because we know this was going to be too bright. Okay, so that's a lot more controlled now. Okay. It's funny, when you use it correctly, it doesn't look like garbage. Who knew? Who knew? That's kind of cool. You know what I'm going to do? One second. Let's just uh, go to... Whoops, don't need to... Not the tone mapping operators. Play with Vert's list. Let's remove one of these walls. Go back to the REPL, say reset. And one of these one of these walls will have vanished. Nice. There we go. Let's go here. Should have done this ages ago. Cool. Right, now let's bugger around with this. Bunday bro. So let's do. Always have to have something animated, don't we? So let's do um, plus one sign now. Give it a slightly higher range. Uh, yeah, let's put it at 8,000. And that light will ramp down and ramp back up again. And it'd be nice if it did it a little faster because. Because it would. That is all. Yeah, that looks way better than it did last time we fucked around with it. So let's have a look at that. What was the other one that... The Burgess Dawson one that looked like garbage because I was using it incorrectly. And even though I haven't written down here that no power 1 over 2.2 is necessary. See down here? Power to 1 over 2.2. It's already been done. Color and exposure, that's all I needed. Color and exposure. So let's start with one. Let's swap this out. Oof. 
0.1. Let's go have a look. I'm going to ramp down that green a bit just so I can get in here and have a look. Still as heavy on the blues, but it's not nearly as bad as it was before. Yeah. Cool. All right. Oh, I'm glad I spotted that before the end of the stream because that would have been a real kick in the teeth afterwards. Very nice. Where's that sign? There. What? Nice. Right. Blimey, there's stuff going on. Kid 77A. If I wasn't so old, I'd know how to say that. You try and turn it off and on? I did. It's all I do. <laughs> how 3D ready is this? Ah, oh, that's that's good. I'm glad to see you. Like, in, a, in the absence of other shit posting, we got a professional in. Hello, sir. Make a video game with it? Yeah, maybe. To be honest, I just like playing with toys. So it's, uh, whatever. Wait, what? That's not what I wanted to change. I wanted to change this down here. Whoop. Yeah, that is a bit more balanced. I like that. What FPS right now? It will be 60 because it's capped. Um, but, you know, you uncap that and it'll go silly. Actually, I don't know. I don't care. What am I doing? I don't know. Uh, gonna make the next G mod. That'd be dope. But yeah. It'll go fast. That's all it will. It will. Actually, you know what? It probably won't look any different because the this the only bit that's animating right now is this light and it's based on time not on, F, on FPS. So turning this up is going to just run the frames real fast. Now, nah, mate, I'm fine. I don't think I'll be looking at that. Anyway, what are we at now? 2142. I think we're done. i got to push this. Whoop. Let's have a look. Chop off a wall and use Nineveh. There we go. So, I don't know what's next, actually. Um, I suppose we can have a look at the... I mean, probably enough for today. The other stuff on the advanced lighting. Um, let's have a look. Normal mapping. Yeah, it's kind of simple stuff. Just displacing normals and things like this based on the texture. Um, that would be kind of fun to do. I suppose we can do that. It'll be an easy one to do one stream. Um, we'll have to look for tangents. But yeah, make sure they're doing tangents based normals. Because otherwise it is wrong. Um, parallax mapping. It's about really distorting some things to get some fake depth. Um, bloom. I suppose we should do a bloom episode at some point. Again, it's the techniques are not hard. Um, there's some nice tricks to get things fast. Um, yeah, that would actually be a nice combination. We should throw that on one of these scenes as well. I've got some bloom in um, some of the couple examples. I've got a bloom shader in there. It's pretty hacky, but it works. Deferred shading. Um, I think we actually did some deferred shading a while ago in one of the streams. But again, you're like, like doing deferred lighting is really the thing here. Deferred shading, actually just doing a few passes and stuff like this and doing lighting in a separate pass. That's fine. SSAO. Um, that would also be interesting. Might have to look at that too. So yeah, I'm not sure where we go from this. Really, we've done some of the, uh, we've done some shadow mapping. I don't think we've done point shadows yet. Uh, but it's a similar kind of deal, just using a cube map rather than a um, plain texture, or however you're remapping onto the texture that you had. H, uh, not HDR. Where am I looking at? PBR. This would be kind of interesting. 
um, but it will be a, a long old road to get this stuff right. I've, um, I've struggled with this already before, like not on stream. Um, getting, getting just good inputs was a real difficult thing. Um, I'm going to have to, basically I burnt out kind of trying to do that before. I got some of this working. Um, but I guess I really need to take this guy's examples and reverse engineer everything. Um, but this is one of the more recent techniques, very well, recent, like 2013 techniques for um, describing materials and describing lighting environments in an accurate way, in a physically based way. And obviously you get really versatile materials and things like that. So that'd be cool. So we can definitely look into that as well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure actually what we'll switch to next week. I might work on some features or... I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> Wait, how am I doing that stuff with Git? That is Magit. Um, there is a really nice um, Git client in Emacs. Um, I would use Emacs only for this client if I didn't like the rest of it. Um, it's really nice just to go through like and the integration's really good so if i jump here then we're looking at the commit uh this is the code from that commit i can also do i think it works here i can do magic blame which will tell me for every line but well, it's blame but it's actually integrated in here so i can do magic blame again on any section and it'll wind further back in time if there is more history um which there was in that case and then you can quit your way out of it again it really pays off when you're doing um, rebasing. So if I wanted to like move this commit before this commit and then squash one, I could say I can pick the earliest commit in the rebase range to rebase interactive. And I can grab this two lights one and just move it up like here. And then I'm going to squash it into this. And so now if I do control C, control C, it's going to go and do that. But obviously I've done something really daft. So there's going to be conflicts. So I would have to, it's giving me the the point I am in the rebase history, the things I need to fix, all that kind of shit. I'm just going to do a rebase abort and then I'll be back to where I was. But it is just so good and you can manage all your branches. It's, it's really nice. It's really nice. And it integrates with all the other stuff that's in Emacs as well. So if I, is that going to work? Let's see. Uh, no, that won't have a git repo on there. Ah, I can make one though. If I do, let's see. I've just got to, don't need the doodling device anymore. Yep. If I browse to another server, like testing dot dice will suffice dot com give that a second um it doesn't like my public key oh yeah i know why ah ssh that was it ubuntu i think it's the user that i've got still on there at um testing dot dice will suffice.com give that a second it'll chew its way through right so now i'm on that server um, so I can browse to a directory. Um, I'm just going to make deer quickly. Foo, here's a foo directory. Did that work? Oh, I couldn't make it there. I wonder why. That's strange. Well, anyway, if you did... Um, git status here it'll match it will ask you if you want to turn this into a git repository and we'll start a repo for you um it's probably going to deny it's going to be permissions based the reason i haven't i can't do this um but yeah we're not inside a git repo but all that stuff is transparent you can also walk inside docker containers and all that kind of stuff it's cool if you're a big old nerd which i certainly am gonna move away from github no um, oh, Sergeant Queef, you're using Emacs as your window manager. How's that going? Last time I tried, I had real problems with um, doing Keppel stuff, so I moved back to Stump again. But I would love to switch away. Well, I'd, I'd, 
I love stump, but I would it would be really cool to just have Emacs handle that. Um, oh, the line drawing stream. Good point. I should write that down, but I don't have normal writing devices anywhere. Oh, well. Um, yes, line drawing. We've got to do that. <laughs> but yeah that's it i think that's it guys if i hang around for much longer it, like if you've got any questions or anything about any of this shit or any any of the weirdy lesbian stuff we do on here i'm happy to answer questions otherwise i don't want to outstay my welcome so i will uh bugger off ways what about firefox firefox works fine Yeah, I know I can type the the things, but if I just put it in some file, I'm not going to remember to go back. I should let me just go put it on my whiteboard. One second. Any more for any more? You have some seconds. Yeah, we should look at some line drawing stuff. I mean, the basic stuff should be really simple, right? Like, it should just be... What time is it now? 51. Let's just see. Uh, if we make a GPU array, um, and the initial contents are... I don't know, some some array of vec twos. I get so, so no, it's two zero 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 two. Um, one hundred, one hundred, one hundred. There we go. That'll do. Um, the element type is uh, vec three, and now we've got GPU array. So def var temp two or whatever. There we go. So there's our GPU array. Just quickly make sure that the data is there. Well, that looks like shit. What the fuck happened there? It did not work. Oh yeah, of course, one second. Because the boy is stupid, that is why. Let's try it again, there we go. Some values. Um, let's... Uh, Let's get out of the past and go back to what we're actually working on, which is in render. Let's take this shiz. Actually, we don't even need this. So we're taking vert, which is going to be a vec3. Uh, we're going to pass it through pretty much unchanged. We don't have texturing to do, so there's that. Um, and then there's a fragment. Let's just make it red. There we go. Line V. Line F. There we go. One, two. Um, is there anything else to do? Line pipeline. Takes effect three. Wait a second. This doesn't take effect two. And it doesn't take these either. Fuck off. It's just that. Effect three. Done. Ugh. What doesn't it like? Oh, yeah. I've still got them. I'm using the wrong ones. Line, line. There we go. Now. There are some things we need to do. I think it just is line. Let's look at the docs. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of them. Let's max this for a second. Line. Line, 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 line. Lines. Okay. Primitive type. This specifies what primitives can be passed into this pipeline. By all, by default, all pipelines except triangles. Um, when you map a buffer stream over a pipeline, the primitive kind of the stream must match the pipeline. Cool, so we're gonna do lines. Easy enough. Oh, one second. Ripple. Okay, so, defun. Draw a line. And we need to make a stream as well. Um, we'll just do it from here. Temp2 was our GPU array. Um, so now we're going to make a 
buffer stream out of that. Um, we're just passing in temp2, and we want to say that the primitive type is lines. Okay, so def var temp3 is that. So down here, let's just do map g over, oops, line p line, passing in temp3. And then what do we need to do? Well, I guess we need to call it. Um, play with verts, where's our main loop in here? So after we clear the FBO, we're just going to draw the line. Oh, look! <laughs> it is not in world space. So it looks really weird. Um, but yeah, we've got a line. It's just uh, being drawn in clip space. So it's not respecting how we move. Can you see that? That's probably very dark. Um, let's just make it white one second. Is that showing up? There's meant to be a line thickness as well, isn't there? GL uh, line something? Line width? Uh, three. Oh, yeah, there we go. Five. There's a line. Apparently, there's not much to it. Um, well, that's the basic stuff anyway. But we would kind of like it to be... Oh, we've still got some minutes. Let's try and get this to be like our other stuff, like in world space. Da 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 da. Uh, where would that be? Right, we go play with verts. Let's go and look at the draw function because it'll all be in here. Right, so they pass in a model to world and a world to view and a view to clip. Let's just take all of that shit and we will dump it down in here. Model to world space. Well, we don't actually need that. We'll just do M for identity. Um, and the other ones are all based on the camera. Let's just let camera be whatever the... Do we have a current camera? Is that how we work this out? Current camera. There we go. It's freaking out because there's... All these arguments that has no idea about. It's like, what are you doing? Um, so let's go and play with verts dot lisp. Let's go look at draw again because that's where we were, and it was all about this pipeline. Oh, it's the one that we passed in, which is some pipeline. Jump over here. Doesn't know where we're going. Uh, abort. Um, some pipeline. Where is that? Probably around here somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, there it is. Some vert stage. Here we are. Let's steal this code and dump it down here and then use it. Okay, so the first thing we need is this stuff. This will satisfy the fact that we're trying to pass in loads of arguments and it has no idea what we're talking about. So let's do that. SLDB and say continue. Hopefully it's running again or has it stopped? No, it's running. Cool. Oh yeah, it's actually you can see the colors and lights moving so it's fine um, now we want to transform things so we've got the position um, which is just which is oh we can just call this pos uh, we don't have normals um, let's just dump this code in like and clean it up all right so we've got a position already we don't have normals we don't have uvs we do have a model position uh, we do have a world position yep and uh, we do have a view position and what else? We don't need this because we don't have normals. Uh, we have a bit of clip position. Yeah, so we go to model. Yeah, we take the model space to world space to view space to clip space. Mm, pardon me. And um, yeah, that's clip space. That's the only thing we actually need out of this. So now we have a line that's also 3D. We can come down here. Notice that it's always the same thickness. Um, no matter how close we get. Because of this kind of line rendering. This is the GL standard line rendering. It's kind of garbagey. Oh, I'm all over the place. 
Um, it's pointing off in that direction. Let's let's change that data. So if we look at temp, was it temp two that had our GPU array? Yeah, let's pull G temp two. And we can see our values here. Um, and now we're gonna take this, and I'll just fuck around with it a bit. I'm gonna go list um, to get it in the shape where we want it. We want it to evaluate that code. And then we're going to push G this back to temp two. But we're going to make some modifications. So rather than that way, uh, we're going to say minus 100. And now it's pointing that way. And let's do this. Boop. And let's make this minus 20, maybe. Yeah, there we go. Do we have anti-aliasing? Yes, but not turned on. I actually turned it off for this stream um, just because um, we were going to be dealing with other post-processing stuff. And I didn't want to risk it. But we do, let's actually go, where are we? Um, right at the end of this pipeline. Where is it? Splat. Here we go. We're doing tone mapping on the Uncharted stuff. Um, let's call this mapped. And then let's call, I think Nineveh has this because we did it the other week, which was anti-aliasing. We have, really? Oh, FXA2, that'll do. Actually, I should be able to CC and see its arguments. Um, UV texture and RCP frame. I can't remember how to use it. <laughs> what? What? Okay, one second. Let's check. Uh, let's check Git. At the beginning of the evening. Come on, where is it? FX. Where did I? When did I remove it? I did it right before the stream. One of these ones I did it. No, it can't be there because that's already way too late. That is very strange. I'm just expanding the code to see if Hmm. I must have nuked it at some other point. Very strange. No, and we did it just the other week. F, X, A, A, come on. Where are we? There we are. Ah, oh, come on. So it's UV is a VEC4. Oh, yeah, it expects the... Oh, it does it from a texture? That's kind of annoying, actually. Hmm. Oh yeah, so it's almost like a post-process on its own. Okay, so yes, we do. <laughs> do I forget my own API? Of course I did. Well, uh, yeah, we'll have to do that another day. <laughs> we'll, we'll bring that back in later. I, I just can't remember this stuff right now. That um, FXAA wants to be used as a separate pass, which we could do, but I'm over time now, so I won't do that because it'll take another. It'll just take another few minutes, but I'll let my partner get back to being able to make noise again. Anyway. Uh, you're going to do physics? No. Um, that would be a pain in the butt. Yeah, that stuff's way over my head, man. It's it's really cool, but it's just way out there. Um, I want to learn more about, especially networked physics stuff, but not in a hurry, I don't think. Um, Sergeant Creepers, you move one of the balls and make the line a little thicker. <laughs> um, have you met Foe? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've met Foe. Yeah, it's one of the um, this symposium things. <laughs> Drawing tens of thousands of lines in 3D. Well, it's easy. You just do instancing, right? And change the values. Right, we're over time. We're over time. We've gone from having loads of time to overtime. So thank you all so much. It's been really nice having you. Um, it's lovely to see a bunch of you in the chat. And, and just for poking so many questions at me as well. I hope the line stuff was useful. We'll look at other line rendering things in future. 
and uh yeah that'll do peace